This week I was going to record a video about the Cinemassacre truth, but in the immortal words of James Rolfe, I don't have time. So instead, I, uh, last week, was watching some YouTube videos, as I tend to do, and I came across this video by Matt Walsh from about a year ago called Why Does 40% of Gen Z identify as LGBT. And this video really caught my attention for a few reasons. And I think that this video will be a good conversation starter for talking about my thoughts on LGBT people uh, in general. Now, Mount Walsh is one of these people who, before you even click on his video, you, ex you know exactly what his take is gonna be on pretty much every issue. He is a conservative who focuses most, if not all, of his content on identity politics, and so his stance on LGBT people is going to always default to the negative. And so with a video title like, Why Does 40% of Gen Z Identify as LGBT?, you can assume that his position is going to be that it is wrong for 40% of Gen Z to identify as LGBT, and that this is, this can be explained by some sort of pernicious social contagion that is influencing these uh, young people to incorrectly claim to be LGBT when they are merely following some sort of uh, social trend. And then you can surmise that this trend is bad for society and we should try to figure out how to do something to mitigate it. I myself, on the other hand, would like to think of myself as someone who is a little bit harder to nail down. I don't think that you're gonna click on every one of my videos knowing exactly what my take is going to be on every subject. And that's because I am not a grifter nor a demagogue who says things in order to get money. I am just a person who actually likes the dialectical process, actually enjoys discourse and ideas. My brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high-level important ideas. And cares about them, and so I have a lot of thoughts, but maybe not a lot of conclusions. And I'm distrustful of people who have too many conclusions. But yeah, Matt Walsh is a cis, het, white, male conservative, which is probably the demographic who the SJW crowd hates the most. And it's probably the demographic that understands LGBT issues the least. I don't think that uh, Matt Walsh is closeted. I know that it's very common to meme on this kind of person and assume that everyone who has a problem with LGBT people must be in the closet. I think that might be true for Michael Knowles. He does kind of give me that vibe, but Matt Walsh, I don't think so. He doesn't really set off my gaydar. I just think he's clueless. Not closeted, just clueless. But that's where I come in because I think I have uh, perhaps bit better perspective for talking about this kind of thing than he does. So maybe I can kind of explain it to people like him in a way that maybe they can understand it a little bit better. And though while I'm not a conservative like Matt Walsh, I am also not really much of anything. Which means as much as I might disagree with Matt Walsh, I'm probably also going to disagree with the people he disagrees with quite a lot too. Like if the idea of deconstructionism is to break down ideas and beliefs into their component parts and then restructure them into something better, I'm like that, but without the restructuring. I'm just about breaking things down. And no, I'm not gonna go soft on LGBT ideology just because it's the politically correct thing to do. But like I said, this video really caught my eye because 40% is quite a large number. 40% of a certain generation of people are now identifying as LGBT. I don't know exactly how accurate this figure is. I don't know what samples they pulled from to come at this number, but um, even still, if it's anywhere approaching true, then we're onto something a little bit strange, aren't we?
But I suppose where the real clincher comes in is that I am Gen Z, so I, I belong to this age demographic that he's talking about. And I suppose I am also LGBT. I suppose I would be lying if I said I wasn't. So this video is about me. And when something really weird is happening with a group of people that you are a part of, I think you kind of want to know about it. Kind of want to think about it at least. And if you're like me, you kind of want to hear what other people have to say about it. So let's hear. Recently, a study conducted by Arizona Christian University was published. George Barna, the university's cultural research center's director, led the research to call the results of this research uh, striking would be a significant understatement. It's hard to come up with one single word to describe this, so uh, we'll just get into it. Here's the summary from an article in Newsweek. It says, 30% of millennials identify as LGBTQ, according to a soon-to-be-released study that's based on scientific polling data. Among Christians, the numbers were lower, but only slightly, with just under 30% of millennial Christians identifying as LGBTQ. The portion of the population that described itself as gay has varied over the years from 10% based on research by Alfred Kinsey, a widely promoted and widely promoted by the National Gay Task Force. You know, if I could go my whole life without ever hearing the name Alfred Kinsey ever again, that would only be for the better. In 1977 to less than 6% in a recent Gallup poll. Now, a couple of notes about that before we look at these results more closely. Uh, you may recall from our discussion of Alfred Kinsey a couple months ago that the 10% figure was completely bogus at the time. Kinsey wanted there to be a large portion of homosexuals in the country. He wanted to create a society where heterosexuality was but one mode of sexuality among a, an array of equal options. Seems like he largely succeeded on that front. And so he falsified his research to, to kind of get the ball rolling, so to speak. He surveyed male prostitutes, sex offenders, men in prison, carefully choosing from non-representative samples of the population, and then extrapolated all kinds of conclusions about male sexuality based on that. The prevalence of homosexuality was the least of what he falsely concluded. Now, this is relevant because it shows how there's been a very real plot, a plan. Yes, if you like a conspiracy to fundamentally change human sexuality. Okay, so this is one of the main points of his video that he actually brings up later on in the video too. And it kind of gets to the Matt Walsh and the broader right wing pundit grifter uh, sort of modus operandi, I guess you could say. Somebody who honestly believes that there is a conspiracy going on of this nature would at least identify which people are conspiring. This is something that Matt Walsh doesn't do in this video. He never says who the conspirators are. He just insists that they are. And there are many, many, many right-wing figures who do this exact same thing. And the reason they do it seems to be that if you are on the right and you're listening to a message like this, you can interpret whatever you want into the blank. The main enemy of the conservative is they. Who are they? Well, who do you think they are? They could be the Jews. They could be the Bilderberg group. They could be the Illuminati. They could be the mainstream media, except for Fox News, unless you're one of the Newsmax crowd, in which case Fox is a part of the mainstream media. They could be Silicon Valley, Bill Gates, George Soros. They could be a lot of things, but they are almost never the rich. Don't get me wrong, usually they are rich. But for some reason, it's not all rich people. It's just some of them. Because we can't hate all rich people, because that would make us socialists. And yet nobody except for the rich could have the kind of power and influence that could make us, the patriots, the family-loving, traditional Americans, 
underdogs. We just want them to leave us alone. Even though we want to be rich and empower rich people to do whatever they want to do. But if they're doing something that we don't like, then that's a problem, even though we want them to do whatever they want to do. We want to drain the corruption out of Washington. We want to drain the swamp. We want to get rid of all of the corrupt billionaires. And yet we want to get rid of any and all legislation that would accomplish that. You know, there's a lot of talk about this sort of union between right-wing populism and left-wing populism. And sure, if you look at polling data, the right tends to, you know, on the ground level, they tend to actually kind of want a lot of the same things that the left wants, like Medicare for All tends to poll really well, even among Republican voters. So maybe in that sense, you could say that there exists a kind of right-wing populism, but it doesn't actually have any teeth. But most of what is termed right-wing populism is mostly just this kind of fake populism, like fake anarchism. Like I ran into a lady once who once said that she's like against the government, but what she really just meant is that she's a conservative. There's a lot of these people who style themselves libertarians, but they're really just conservatives. It was set in motion by degenerate quacks like Alfred Kinsey and John Money, and now we're seeing uh, the fruits of their label, labor. So a little more from Newsweek. It says, the poll looked at so-called millennials defined as someone born from 1984 to 2002. About 78 million individuals representing a quarter of U.S. population. Among millennials, 30% identifies LGBTQ, LGBTQ more than three times that of the rest of the adult population. And when the researchers broke out uh, the youngest of the group, ages 18 to 24, which is really Gen Z, they found 39% call themselves LGBTQ. Okay, so we're talking 40%, nearly 40% identifying as LGBT. Now, if this is true, if these numbers are anywhere close to accurate, then we are witnessing not even just a seismic shift in human sexuality, but a full-on transformation unlike anything the world has ever seen before. Many people, though, on both sides of the ideological divide, for different reasons, don't want to believe or admit that such a transformation is actually happening. So they have a few ways of trying to deny or mitigate results like this. On the left, they'll say that uh, this doesn't reflect a change at all. They'll claim that there have always been this many LGBT people in society, but they just didn't feel comfortable revealing themselves. Yeah, I'm not sure how much I buy into this idea on the left that everyone's just closeted and that this insane upswing in people identifying as LGBT is just closeted people finally having the space to not be closeted anymore. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think that's a huge part of what's going on, but something tells me it doesn't explain everything. Until now. That's, that's, that's what they'll say. But this is not credible because older generations have also been surveyed in our current day and age where everybody is very accepting and tolerant and all of that. Older generations are also surveyed and their numbers are much, much lower. So the left's theory kind of waves a magic wand over millions of Americans and declares that, you know, they're all closeted gays with no evidence at all for such an assertion. Um... Okay, I don't think Matt Walsh really understands what being closeted is. Because he's acting like the mere fact that it's now socially acceptable to be LGBT means that everyone who is closeted or was closeted should now be out of the closet or almost everyone. But usually closeted people are not just pretending that they're not gay or pretending that they're normal they're they actually kind of believe it or want to believe it themselves and are not they don't actually know that they're lgbt and it makes sense that older generations of people would have a harder time kind of 
processing this because for young people, they're so malleable in a way and they're so interested in identity. Identity is actually something that very much interests young people because it's a very new thing for them. Like uh, little kids like using their bodies a lot because, well, for one thing, they're a lot easier to use than adult bodies. They're a lot more um, quick and flexible and bouncy, but also they're just a lot more new to it than adults. Adults are kind of like, okay, I'm over that. An adult doesn't want to move unless he absolutely has to. A kid wants to move all the time. And I see it kind of the same way with identity where someone who's in their 40s or 50s, are they really going to want to have a big identity changing moment? If you've been living pretty comfortably or just used to your discomfort for a really long time, there's not really a lot of motivation to change who you are. So I don't really think that this mere fact disproves the left-wing hypothesis that this is all just about closeted people finally having the space to not be closeted anymore, or people who now, these days, n never had any reason to be in the closet in the first place. And if you've never had any reason to be in the closet in the first place, I think it's far less likely that you are going to remain closet. I mean, <laughs> you're not going to be closeted, but like people who are in their 40s and 50s are much more likely to remain that way for their whole lives, even if it's now socially acceptable for them not to be that way, just because it's what they're used to. And maybe they're just unaware that there's anything, any need to go beyond that, or they just don't feel a need to go beyond that in life. But I do think there's a little bit more to this. Also, if we're looking at this from a purely biological and evolutionary perspective, it doesn't make any scientific sense that 40 or 50% or more of a species would be non-heterosexual. Now, the left claims that homosexuality is biological, right? Um, then if that's true, then a 40 or 50% figure simply could not happen for evolutionary reasons. Unless you want to argue that evolution isn't true. Keep in mind. Hold on. The left loves to claim also that homosexual activity exists in the animal kingdom, right? You hear this all the time. Well, find me a species where nearly half are homosexual. Bonobos. There, I found you, your fucking species, Matt Walsh. I think this is one of the dumbest points that he makes in this video because he's conflating LGBT with gay and acting like the, this 40% of Gen Z identifying as LGBT is identifying as homosexual. In reality, there's a lot more to LGBT than just exclusive attraction to the same sex. So it makes no sense to claim that it would be evolutionarily disadvantageous to have a high proportion of LGBT people in a population because let's say 80% of those LGBT people are bisexual and 10% of them are transsexual. How is that going to be a huge reproductive detriment to the population? Take the bonobos, for instance. I would say probably 40% of them are LGBT. That doesn't exist. It can't exist because such, such a species would go extinct. No. Judging by the fact that the bonobos haven't gone extinct, I would say you're wrong. So this theory doesn't work. But you'll have people on the right who deny it as well. They, you know. This guy is almost like those people who are like, let's just send all the gay people to an island. That way they can't reproduce. Problem solved. Amazing how we've never thought of that before simply because they don't want to believe that the LGBT brainwashing of kids has really been this tremendously successful. They just don't want to believe it. It's, 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 it's something that they can't wrap their heads around, and so they say, no, there's no way. And they'll say the numbers here are wrong. Yet the problem for them is that these results are just the latest in a long line of research conducted both by right-leaning and left-leaning organizations, and they all come to the same sort of conclusion. Yeah, it's funny that he brings up conservatives not wanting to believe that something bad is happening because I don't think I've ever 
heard of that in my life. It seems like nothing pleases a conservative more than being afraid or being angry. So I would not characterize them as the kind of people to be in denial over bad news. Gallup, as mentioned uh, by Newsweek, they did a major poll several months ago. They didn't find that 30 or 40% of Gen Z identify as LGBT, but they did find that 15% identified that way and another 5% had no opinion about their own sexuality. So that's 20% not identifying as heterosexual. A smaller portion, but still 10 times their parents' generation and 20 times their grandparents' generation. So whether it's 20% or 30 or 40, it's almost splitting hairs. The point is that there is a trend here, a very dramatic trend. And it's a trend against spanning generations, which rules out the other dismissive claim, which you still hear from some on the right, that this is all a fad, right? LGBT identification for the kids today, it's like what um, emo or goth was when I was a kid. But we know it's not just a fad of that sort, because you find this trend, again, spanning generations, starting with my grandparents going all the way down to my kids' generation. LGBT identification has risen by large portions each step of the way until today. We also know that it's not just a fad because fads, when we were kids, were treated like fads. Adults would tell you, you know, if you were a, a goth, an adult would say to you, this is a fad. You're, you're going to look back on this and be embarrassed. What they didn't say to the goth kid is, this is your truest identity. You should define yourself by your gothness. This is the most important thing about you. Here, I made you this flag. March through the street with it. Let everybody know. This is who you are and will always be. If adults had said that, then there would be, there'd still be a lot of people in my generation today walking around with dyed hair and makeup. There are. What, what are you talking about? Does Matt Walsh not realize that he's a millennial? Matt Walsh is not just a millennial. He's like peak millennial. I thought he was older than this, but he's only born in 1986. You can't get more millennial than that. There are plenty of people in Matt Walsh's generation who are still goth. And I don't really know if I would consider that a fad as much as just a subculture. Maybe it's a phase that a lot of people go through, but it seems like a pretty recurrent one. And if even if it's not the specific goth subculture with the specific music, there's usually something like scene or emo or something that comes along that is kind of just rebranded goth. It's all basically punk. You know, you can just lump goth and everything else under the punk label because that's really all it is. And punk has been around here for 50 years. So at this point, I don't see it as a fad. I just see it as a subculture. Fad is something like fidget spinners or vine or flagpole sitting. It's something that got really popular for a very brief period of time and then disappeared. A phase is something completely different. A phase is something personal. You can get into something that is a phase for you, but not a fad for the broader culture. So a lot of people have goth phases. And I think some people probably have LGBT phases. I think it's a real thing. Mine has been going on for 10 years, so uh, at this rate, I don't know if I'm ever getting out of it. Well, in fact, there are a lot of people in my generation walking around that way, but not because they identify as goth. And that's the point. Uh -huh. So if this is not a fad, He's which talking it about is, the makeup and crazy hair. And if it is not a natural biological occurrence, which is only today finding its true expression, which it also isn't, then what's going on? Well, what's going on is social contagion, a kind of mass hysteria, a group hallucination, in effect, but one that is constructed, fabricated. Okay, oh, this is all intentional. Okay, so uh, social contagion is not necessarily a mass hysteria. It can be. Um, mass hysteria is a very specific kind of social contagion, I would say. Um, but social contagion is just any case where somebody's doing something and then other people are like, oh, that looks cool. I'm going to do it. Would it be fair to characterize this huge upswing of LGBT identifying Gen Z people, Zoomers? Would it be fair to characterize that as mass hysteria? Mm, I think I'm a little bit iffy on that. It's certainly not mass hysteria in like the traditional sense of like that African 
village where everyone had the laughing disease for a week. But I do think that social contagion does play a major role in why a lot of kids in particular are identifying as, in particular, transgender. Because sexual orientation is whatever. You can like whatever you like, you can lie about it, who cares? Gender identity is something a lot more nebulous. It's something that doesn't even really have a concrete definition, which means it's very easy for anybody to just kind of get whatever they want out of the idea of gender. And I think that makes it very easy for it to spread like a social contagion, particularly now in the day of TikTok. But a few years ago, it was Tumblr. But now I would say that TikTok is a fair, a fair bit more popular than Tumblr ever was. But let's hear a bit more Matt Walsh. It is social engineering on a scale. And oh, yeah, the social engineering thing. Ugh. I would like to socially engineer Matt Walsh's brain to work about 70% better. A level previously unknown to mankind. Interesting he talks about. So social engineering is an interesting subject. Um, I know that there is a thing called cultural Marxism, which has kind of gotten a lot of press, but it really, I think it goes back to the Italian communist Antonio Gramsci, who basically had this idea that we, we need not only create the material revolution we also needs must create the cultural revolution the two must go hand in hand because we can't have a true material revolution without also having a cultural revolution and so that requires a form of social engineering and so someone like antonio gramsci or maybe someone like mao for instance might actually take it upon themselves to initiate a social engineering program. And I would say that this is something that a lot of rich people do on a regular basis, both left and right. For instance, I would say that PragerU is an example of propaganda being used as a form of social engineering. And I would say that kind of the whole right-wing sphere of politics is focused around using, weaponizing identity politics as a way to socially engineer people to be more receptive to um, what is basically neoliberal uh, economics. That's my conspiracy theory. I think it's a bit more convincing than Matt Walsh's conspiracy theory because people like Matt Walsh and the conservatives have a different idea that uh, the rich and powerful want to create weak men. That's essentially what it comes down to. The whole LGBT thing, uh, breaking down all of our social values, the social fabric of society, the family. What this does is it makes everyone weak, particularly the men. It lowers their testosterone level, and there are chemical ways to do this as well, like the chemicals that are turning the freaking frogs gay. And over time, this creates weak men who are too comfortable, too complacent, and unable to maintain the social fabric, and easy to manipulate to profit off of, basically. I don't know. It seems... I, I think that my conspiracy theory is a bit more believable than his, but in the end, we're both talking conspiracy theories. As it happens, I think Dr. Seuss believed in my conspiracy theory more than Matt's because he wrote a whole book about it called The Sneetches. We've seen brainwashing before, but never like this. And never has it started so young. So this seems relevant, a video that went viral. We've seen brainwashing before, but never has it started so young. Oh, okay, so when I in kindergarten learned the Pledge of Allegiance and was told to do it every single day without even knowing what the fuck those words meant, when I in elementary school was exposed to every flavor of patriotic American song you can think of and told to sing them 
every week. When I, as a young coin collector of seven or eight, was looking at my money and seeing messages like, In God We Trust, and E Pluribus Unum, and liberty. You're telling me that that wasn't brainwashing? You're telling me that that wasn't social engineering? You're telling me that I wasn't young at that time? Uh, this week, like a million other videos of this type, uh, we've got, again, very young boy, four years old in this case, paraded on camera um, in the female alter ego that his mother has imposed on him, and she's very proud of it. What evidence does Matt Walsh have that this mother imposed this female alter ego on this child? He never gives his evidence, which leads me to believe that he has none. In the same way that he never identifies who is committing this conspiracy, this grand conspiracy to undermine the values of our society, which leads me to believe that he hasn't actually uncovered any conspiracy at all. He has only looked at a problem seen that there are other people in positions of power who might be contributing to the problem, and then inferred, grand conspiracy, grand brainwashing effort, grand social engineering project. You know, perhaps individuals have different opinions. Perhaps Dennis Prager, a rather wealthy, well-off Jewish individual, believes that rich people can't do anything wrong and that traditional American values are the way to go and that the Enlightenment was a mistake. But somebody a little bit more wealthy than he, let's say Bill Gates, might feel a little bit differently and both sides will use their own influence to create the kind of social change that they would like to see, but it's usually to their benefit, whatever it is. I don't know, like Warren Buffett has this whole cult of personality because he's the least awful of the mega rich. Everyone has a different opinion and they'll use their power and influence, whatever they have, in order to affect the kind of change they would like to see. I am included in that. Matt Walsh is included in that when he's not grifting. All of us are included in this grand social project, this grand social engineering scheme to create the kind of change that we would like to see as individuals. It's really, it's really not that strange, Matt. Let's listen to that. To your face, Ty. Makeup. You put makeup on it? Mm hmm How old are you? Okay, let's acknowledge the fact that this kid's makeup is not on fleek, but... I gotta say, like, it's not a bad look for a four-year-old. I'm not expecting a four-year-old to look fucking fabulous. And if anything, the fact that he has kind of mediocre makeup application skills is kind of cute. Seven? No, how old are you? Seven! You're four. No, he's seven! I identify as a seven-year-old, madam. So don't tell me how old I am. If I say I'm seven years old, I'm seven years old. Or do you remember that 56-year-old dude who identified as a 60-year-old girl? At a certain point, I kind of feel like you just got to accept what you are. Like you can't change how many times you've been around the sun. You can say, hey, I like pretending to be a six-year-old. I like pretending to be a girl. And if, if you're with people who are okay with that, then I don't really see what's wrong with that. Even though you are strange, all of us are strange in some ways. I'm definitely strange. Nobody would do what I do if they weren't strange. But that's kind of how I feel about this whole thing. Like, you know, Blair White, say what you will about her. She has her problems. I'm not a huge Blair White stan or anything. But what I le at least respect about Blair White is she says, hey, I'm not a woman. I'm a trans woman. And there's a difference. I am a person who wants to be a woman, who lives her life as a woman, who wants to be treated as a woman, who likes being a woman. But I don't claim to really know what it's like to be a real woman. And just because I identify as a woman, that doesn't make me automatically a woman. And I just feel like if the LGBT community had this kind of intellectual honesty, 
they would accept that position a lot more, and I think they would be happier for it. You were a baby, were you a girl? Yes. Are you in a boy's body, though? Mm, yes. Yeah. Okay, tell TikTok bye. Bye. Yeah, who who bought him that makeup? This is his choice, right? Who bought him the uh, the the little? Okay. Just because he doesn't have money doesn't mean it wasn't his choice to wear makeup. Yeah, okay. So he's he's upset about the makeup and the little pink dress, saying, "Who bought those?" It was his choice, right? Dude, like any little boy could say to his mom. I want to wear makeup. You, I, I, I'm looking at, I'm looking at you putting on makeup every morning. I want to do that. Any little boy could say to his mom, "Hey, I see you wearing dresses. I want a dress. Give me a dress." Any little boy could say that. Any little boy could be like, "I like feminine style. I like that. I want to do that." In fact, you say you're a, you're a woman. You say you're a girl. Well, I want to be a girl. That looks like fun. Any little boy could say that. That doesn't matter. <laughs> like, the money has nothing to do with it. I mean, sure, she she um, facilitated his choice to be a girl, to wear makeup, but who says that that was her idea? I think you're making a lot of assumptions, Matt Walsh. I think you're, <laughs> you're going... Uh, out into cloud cuckoo land here. And I wouldn't have a problem with it if you would at least provide evidence for what he was talking about. Like if there was actual clear evidence that this woman was p p pushing this transgender identity onto her child, then I mean, I would, I would accept, yeah, that's true. I would, ex I would agree with Matt Walsh. Quite an interesting clip. Once you can get past the visceral revulsion the visceral revulsion. It's just... It's, it's fucked up. Because look, I don't buy into a lot of the transgender LGBT ideology, okay? I'm, a, I'm, I'm willing to admit that. But at the same time, like, a, a little four-year-old boy wearing a dress, wearing makeup, like, that's just adorable. It saddens me that Matt Walsh just is just physically repulsed by this, like, <clears throat> he's just disgusted. Where in the rule book does it say that a boy can't wear a dress? I mean, Franklin D. Roosevelt, there are fucking pictures of Franklin D. Roosevelt when he was a toddler, when he was that age, wearing a fucking dress. I mean, people did it, man. It's, this is tradition. This is what you're supposed to be about, isn't it? And makeup, I know that there's a lot of like weird paranoia around makeup. Like there's, there's a lot of girls who aren't allowed to wear makeup until they reach a certain age. And I can, I can kind of understand that. Cause like a little ass six year old girl trying to put makeup on herself is going to make a whole mess of it and look like a shit show. <laughs> but I don't know this little boy, he's wearing makeup and like he he honestly like it's kind of charming that he's he's wearing shitty eye makeup because he's four who cares dude at least he's living his life the way he wants to you know at least he isn't letting some asshole tell him what to do <laughs> at least matt walsh isn't his dad i might not look at this boy and say yeah that's a girl just because he wants to be a girl just because he says he's a a girl in a boy's body like he's four who cares but still like if he wants to wear a dress if he wants to be feminine more power to him especially for his age he's not even in school yet maybe he's in preschool i don't know but who fucking cares i'm not as concerned with with that kind of aspect of this whole thing i guess i'm more concerned with the whole ideology that is created around it and what what kind of what ramifications that has for society like i think i should be allowed to look at this boy wearing a dress wearing makeup and say that is a fucking boy like i'm sorry but it's just fucking true sjw's
there's the door. See, my problem has never been accepting people for what they are. You know, I'll accept you because I am fucked up. I'm problematic even. I make mistakes. I'm evil in my own ways. I'm racist. I'm sexist. I'm a bad person in a lot of ways. So what room do I have to judge other people? I don't judge other people. Unless they're my family members, then I kind of do. But I can't help it. And that's one of the reasons why I'm flawed. So look, I look at other people and I accept them for who they are. But I feel I should also be allowed to have my own opinions about things, right? Isn't that okay? Do we all have to think the same? You notice the incoherent, arbitrary line the mother draws. She'll respect the boy's, she'll, she will respect the boy's self-identification, his alleged self-identification as a girl, but not his self-identification as seven years old. And why not? Age is more fluid and changing than sex, which doesn't change at all. Age is also relative. I mean, relative at least to what planet you're on. There, there are planets in the universe where that boy would actually be seven years old. So why can't he identify as seven then, if he wants? That's actually kind of a good point. But I don't think very many people older than seven really identify with their age at all. I think age gets less important as you get older, and sometimes I forget my own age. I think what Matt Walsh is getting at here is something that I think is important to acknowledge, whether you like it or not. The only reason that people accept this idea that trans women are women or trans men are men is because they want those people to feel better. And this gets to a kind of thing that I have an interest in, which is what I consider society's obsession with gender and this is not something that is recent something which is only pertaining to the trans movement or the lgbt movement or the reaction to that this is something that has existed for thousands of years and something that i'm kind of fucking sick of when i was a kid i can remember being a boy and identifying as a boy, being like, yes, I am a boy. I am not a girl. I will never be a girl. And in fact, if I were to wake up tomorrow in a girl's body, that would be a freaking disaster. I can remember that. But now I think if I woke up tomorrow in a woman's body, it might be a bit of an adjustment. It might be awkward explaining that to my family, if I even could. But in isolation, the idea of being a woman, the idea of having a woman's body doesn't cause me any stress. I don't know. The fact is the fact that I am LGBT is the fact that I do experience sexual feelings toward men is that is that something that influences that maybe it's something that brought me closer to that realization but i think that is a valid realization that what i would have come to if i were heterosexual and i think this kind of gets to the problem that i have with trans people as a whole and the transgender movement as a whole you know i'm okay if you're someone like Blair White who wants to say, hey, I want to be a woman, even though I technically, maybe I'm not a woman, but hey, that's what I want to be. It's what I want to live as. So it's my choice. I accept that because that's honest. That's true. That's self-aware. But at the same time, I feel like if you're someone who is questioning your gender identity, it might be more prudent for you not to think, well, I must be born in the wrong body, but rather to think, maybe I need to change my mindset about gender identity in the first place. Maybe gender matters a lot more to me than it should, because I personally am ambivalent to gender. And 
the concept of gender dysphoria means absolutely nothing to me, even though it did at one point in my past. And I feel like that's because <laughs> maybe on some level, uh, it, I mean, it exists in a real tangible way, but I almost kind of think that it's something you need to grow out of. Like, yeah, it's okay for little kids to feel identified with gender. They're still figuring out the world. They don't know that gender is bullshit. They don't know that gender is a social construct. They don't know that gender is simply looking at biological sex and assuming a lot of things from it. But maybe an adult should look at that and think, do I really need to care about this? Like, what is this feeling I have of body dysmorphia? What is this feeling I have of gender dysphoria? Do I need to feel this way? Is this something I can avoid if possible? Can I accept myself the way I am? And for many people, the answer is no. And you know what? I can't judge because I'm not you. Like, you know, there are plenty of things that I can't get over in my mental health journey. And I would think that someone else would be pretty fucking stupid if they just assumed that I could just decide to get over it. So if you honestly have a serious case of body dysmorphia where you feel like, no, I absolutely need to be the opposite sex, I'm not going to get in your way. And I don't want to get in your way. But at the same time, I really think that if you can, you ought to try to reconsider it because I think it's a lot better to j just accept the way you were born than to try to change everything about yourself. And so that's kind of how I feel about all this social contagion and about all of these kids who are, you know, starting to question their gender identity. I don't blame them for doing it. It's a weird fucking confusing world that we live in and gender is such a weird nebulous concept that I don't blame anyone for getting confused over it. But at the same time, I'm always going to be skeptical of anyone's decision to say that, no, it's the right choice for me to take this mental problem and then take it out on my physical body. To take this feeling of, oh, maybe I don't want to be a man. I don't want to be a woman. And then to extrapolate that into the idea that I am not a man or I am not a woman. I just think you guys might want to take a second look at it. Really, just honestly. Because I am a bit of what you might call a gender abolitionist. In that if we can say that gender is the social aspect of biological sex, maybe we don't need to create such a differentiation between people based on their biological sex. And maybe you can be someone who feels and behaves and acts more like a man, but just isn't one or vice versa. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I almost feel, and you know, here we're getting into kind of straw man territory, so forgive me for being a bit loose with my tongue, but I almost feel like we've done all this work to deconstruct gender and get rid of gender stereotypes and reduce sexism and I almost feel like a lot of this, a lot of these people who are questioning their gender identity are thinking, well, I like being feminine. So that must make me a woman. So now you're creating the stereotype that all women are feminine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which reinforces the belief that all women have to be feminine. And look, I get it's more complicated than that, but I'm just saying it's just something to consider, you know, just like take a chill pill and don't go overboard immediately. That's just my message to the young people, to the TikTok crowd. I don't personally use TikTok. I find it an obscene, repulsive 
platform, but actually I have used it before. I used to have a TikTok account. I'm glad I got rid of that a long time ago. But yeah, that's my message to young people, to teenagers, to people my age. If, you know, if you're going to be transgender, do it with some self-awareness. Do it with some some consideration for people like Matt Walsh who, you know, like, obviously, Matt Walsh is working against my interests in some ways. But I don't think we should hate people like him. I don't think we should hate people who watch him, who think like him. Maybe we get a little bit annoyed by them, but they are trying to understand the world in a way that makes them comfortable. And honestly, ultimately, I don't see you guys as very different in that regard. If you guys can say that a woman is a man and a man is a woman, someone like Matt Walsh saying that that ideology is a grand conspiracy of they, is it that far off, honestly? Just have a little bit of compassion is all I'm saying. So we're about nine minutes through this 11 minute video. Let's see what else he has to say. He says he's seven and the mother has no problem saying, no, 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 you're, you're not seven. You're mistaken about how old you are because you're a little boy and you don't know, you don't understand how age works. Yet, well, we, 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 she won't say that to the boy about his biological sex. And notice how the boy who is uh, supposedly a girl now, and you can't see this if you're just listening to the audio, but they're outside, and, um, and as he's talking about the fact that he's a girl, he's trying to climb on the wall while, while talking about how he's a girl. Now, climbing on walls is a boy activity. I have two of them. That's what they do. We have the wall smudges to prove it. <coughs> oh, God. You know, I said earlier that one of the things he said was like the dumbest point <coughs> in the video. This is the dumbest point in the video. <coughs> so Matt Walsh is trying to claim that only little boys enjoy climbing things. That little girls don't enjoy physical activity. They don't enjoy using their bodies. Ah! This is the most brain dead, retarded fucking take he has made in this video. Dude, I was like one of the least ass athletic kids of my age group. And I remember I had a, a friend who was a little girl and she loved climbing trees, man. And she was so much better at it than I was. There are so many athletic little girls. They love climbing stuff. They love doing things, doing cartwheels. It is totally not just a boy thing to love using your body to do things. And the, the idea that anyone would buy into that is so patently absurd. So does the fact that this little boy likes climbing a wall mean that his gender identity is illegitimate? No, it doesn't. I'm so mad at that that I'm going to pour myself another drink. Lechaim. Yeah, a boy acting like a boy in every way except wearing a dress and putting makeup on his eyes and calling himself a girl. But yeah, in every other way, he's acting like a boy. Yeah, he's been dressed this way by his mother. Says who? Says who? Who says that a little four-year-old boy can't decide? He can't be like walking through the kids section of the clothing store and say to his mother, Hey, I like that pink dress. Buy that for me. Says who, Matt Walsh? Says who? Look, I kind of think that Matt Walsh has a point when he says that this boy doesn't understand the like intricacies of gender ideology. But whatever you want to say about this kid, I don't think it makes sense to just assume 
that this kid doesn't identify as a girl. All the evidence points to the fact that he does identify as a girl. And you're all about the evidence, aren't you, Matt Walsh? The Christian. Hey, at least he gives some credence to evolution. I can at least respect that about him. But no, all the evidence that we have suggests that this boy identifies as a girl. And whether you want to believe that he is a girl just because he identifies as a girl, that's up to you. And I'm not trying to make you think one way or the other on that. Because what is a woman? The topic of that movie you made a few months ago? Yeah. What is a woman? It turns out it's a bit of a controversial subject. And you're allowed to have more than one opinion about it. His entire conception of himself is being altered. His entire conception of himself is being altered. From what? Like, what the fuck do you think this boy started with? Do you think this boy started as a one-year-old with the mentality that, yes, I love America. I love Jesus. I believe in heterosexuality and heteronormativity. I believe in cis-normativity. And I am a cis straight person boy because that's what i was born and that's what god wants me to be and i will respect god and obey do you really believe that this fucking little baby just had that kind of belief on his own before being indoctrinated into that belief before being told to believe that before somebody told him that you have to believe that they're saying that this boy was changed changed from what Exactly. What was he before he was changed into this thing that you despise? His mother cannot make him a girl like she wants, but she can change him drastically and permanently. And a version of this, to some degree or another, is happening to an entire generation. Okay. Um, allow me to walk that back a bit. It appears that Matt Walsh is kind of using this as a launch pad for talking about children transitioning, uh, biologically transitioning with HRT and surgery. And, you know, I don't, I don't really know a lot about that whole process. I don't really know what puberty blockers actually do to you. I don't know how reversible they actually are. So it's not my place to really talk about this kind of thing. But I, I do think in principle, that, you know, doing something like cosmetic surgery or something like, you know, HRT, something like it is something that you should not be entrusted with the responsibility for deciding for yourself unless you are a full-blown adult. And so this mother with her four-year-old child who identifies as a seven-year-old girl, I can definitely imagine her being the sort of mother who would be super into this whole trans acceptance thing and super into allowing her son to transition into a girl prematurely. And I can't say that that is the wrong choice, but I can say that Caution, at least, needs to be taken. Like, I think uh, Jazz Jennings, she was like the first person who I was really exposed to as a trans person. The first time I really, really actually understood what a trans person was outside of this vague term. Like, do you remember back in the day they used to use this word sex change? Like, you just go somewhere and get a se like a, a sex change was just something you got. Like, I'm going to go get a sex change. It's so ridiculous thinking back on it, but that's how people used to talk about it. And that's how it was kind of talked about when I was a kid in, in, in the mid to late 2000s. People were still kind of using that terminology a lot. I really only think it was in the 2010s in the last decade when people started actually understanding the idea of being trans and what that meant and the experience of that. And Jazz Jennings was the first person who I was exposed to who was trans. And like, I look at someone like Jazz Jennings, who I think she transitioned before puberty. And I look at her and I think, well, 
I don't think it was wrong that she did that. I don't think it was wrong that her parents let her do that. There's plenty of other trans people who, who have done that, who have taken like puberty blockers until they're old enough to go on full on HRT. And so like, look, I'm not, I'm not even like totally against it in the way that Blair White is. And Blair White is a trans woman and she's totally against children transitioning in any way. She's even, I think she's even against puberty blockers before you're 18. She's like, she's against all of that kind of thing. But it's not my place to be against that because I just don't know all the facts about it. I don't know all that stuff. And so I, I'm saying like, I'm just kind of ambivalent toward it. But I do think that there is kind of an alarming phenomenon that's happening right now where you have this super huge increase in kids identifying as trans and having gender identity issues. A lot of that, I think, is social contagion. A lot of that, I think, is influenced by TikTok in particular. It used to be Tumblr, but now I think it's TikTok. Those damn Chinese communists. And I think we're now seeing an increasingly difficult path for parents who are concerned about this issue, for therapists who might want to question their client's transition, we're seeing an increasingly difficult path for this to happen, for like some like a sane and rational voice to come in and say, all right, I get where you're at, but let's stop for a second and backtrack a bit. Let's think about what's going on and think about whether this is something that absolutely needs to be addressed physiologically or this is just a mental issue that we haven't quite worked out yet. And that, you know, I'm never the fear monger type, so I'm not going to steer you in that direction. But that, I personally am a little bit concerned about. Not a lot. Like, I don't think that this is a giant fucking threat to humanity like someone like Matt Walsh thinks. But I think it's worthy of at least a little bit of concern because there are people who do detransition. There are people for whom transitioning to the opposite sex doesn't ultimately work. And personally, just something about me feels like it would be better for somebody to just kind of be who they were born as for their whole life and always feel a bit uncomfortable rather than make a huge change and then regret it in the end. That's just my opinion. And you can treat it as that. You don't have to get super mad about it. But we have one minute left in this Matt Walsh video. And so let's uh, let's just see what he has to say to wrap it up. As it happened to much lesser degrees, the generations before them. You know, we're worried about our kids being indoctrinated into critical race theory. We're worried about our kids being indoctrinated into critical race theory. I would like to know if Matt Walsh even has any fucking clue what critical race theory is. Even I don't know what it is, really. I've heard about CRT <laughs> for so long, and even I don't know what it is. Cock replacement therapy. That's what some of you guys need. Some of you guys who are un insecure about your dick size, I feel bad for you because I got... I got a pretty good one. And it's not like my cock is even huge or anything. It's just that I know what a good dick looks like because I'm not straight. You straight men who are insecure about your dick size, I feel really bad for you. But no, we're talking about critical race theory. Even I don't really know what critical race theory is. I would, the thing is, I would pay a hundred dollars. I Fuck that, I would pay a thousand dollars for Matt Walsh to write an essay about critical race theory and submit it to a professor who isn't even an SJW, maybe just a philosophy professor who just happens to know what critical race theory is. I would wager a thousand dollars. 
just to see Matt Walsh write a paper a one-page paper explaining the basics about critical race theory and have a philosophy professor review it. As long as we are clear that the return on my investment <laughs> is that I get my $1,000 back if the, philosophy if the philosophy professor rates it a D or below. Because I have no confidence that Matt Walsh even understands what critical race theory means, let alone has a basis to criticize it. Let's continue. And socialism and becoming Democrats. And socialism and becoming Democrats and everything we hate. But none of that, when it comes to the indoctrination of kids, none of that comes anywhere close to this. Yeah, as opposed to the indoctrination of kids to become conservative. That's not indoctrination. That's just natural. That's just the way of things. That's just how we all are. That's just human, right? To generations of kids being completely redefined, their identities redefined, as we all sit back and watch. Redefined. As we all sit back and watch, their identities redefined as, a as opposed to define in the first place. Do you think that who, who, identify, who defined their identi identities? God? Did he do that? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that God doesn't exist. So what we're left with is you with your shitty opinion and me with my shitty opinion. Who's going to come out on top? The asshole or the person who actually just understands and accepts other people? <laughs> Take your pick. Yeah, okay. Um, I probably had a few more things to say about LGBT issues. I didn't really go in much into the whole facet of um, like sexual identity and, and sexual orientation people kind of redefining what that even means in society. That's something I've thought about this week ever since seeing this video. But what I want to say is I'm grateful for Matt Walsh for providing me this this useful fodder for this video. But anyway, bye-bye. <laughs>